go through and link bits. You see places where you missed a chance to link this to something later, to kind of weave it together. Um, for example, Swedish. Okay, I use the Swedish definition, hortuk, hor, is that what it is? Hortuk, I don't know, I don't speak Swedish, I have no idea. Um, and I made one of Tina's friends Swedish. But I just gave her a Swedish spelling of the name Monica. And I gave her a last name that's Swedish-like. And I had some waffle-shaped cookies in there at her memorial service. Spoiler. Um, and her sister came from Ohio, where there are lots of Swedish. So I just, and I did that. It's for fun. And nobody's ever going to know it but me, right? It's for my amusement. But I hope you like the book. I mean, that goes without saying. But, but yeah, no, that's me trying to, trying to, I don't know, it's just fun. It's just fun. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about the process of actually getting it published? Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> It was really horrible. I had a previous book, a collection of short stories, that was published by Ad Lumen Press, which I should put in a shout for, which is American River College's uh, independent sort of, yeah, it is, press. And, they, and we, they, we publish uh, work sometimes of people who are here. Uh, we haven't really put out a big call yet for manuscripts because Mostly because our, our uh, budget is literally zero, and it's hard to do a lot, you know, with a zero budget. But um, so I had the short stories already out, and Christian had read this in various forms, Tina, in various forms. And, and in the meantime, I'm going like, I need an agent. I've got to have an agent. So I'm writing these letters, which is I'm really bad at, it turns out. Um, I don't know what to say about it. It's like, well, read it, you know? Well, that's not good enough. Uh, so I worked at that for a long, long time, and I don't know how many agents I queried. I would say probably over 100. And it's never easy. They all want something a little different. Send me the first page and the third page. Oh, OK. You know, uh, don't do this. I mean, they use different software to Oh, it's just annoying. Um, but I did it, and I did it, and I did it, and I did it. And meanwhile, Christian was lurking. <laughs> because he had read it, and he wanted Ad Lumen to publish it. So he was waiting for me to fail, <laughs> which I accommodatingly did as far as getting an agent. Um, so that's how. And so then he published it. Who asked me that question? You did dance, OK. Um, and so that was, uh, that's good. And I hope that my next novel, which I think is a little less tricksy, um, will, I can actually find a stand-up actual agent person. Yes, in the back. Well, I don't really, I'm so bad with technology that I don't want to do. Yeah, I know, I know. It's a changing world, and, and I don't, I'm not sure I'm changing as quickly as it is. You know, I'm pretty sure I'm not. So I'm still hoping for a person, you know. Just, they just want your money. Well, if they get my book published by a big publisher, they could have it, <laughs> you know? Uh, Ed Lumen. Uh, if I could push this book really, really, really hard, eventually I would get some money back. But there's no budget, so I can't get the advance. I can't get any of that kind of stuff. Tony. Smooth, I don't know. <laughs> it was amicable, <laughs> if not smooth. Um, he, he, as an editor, he took his editor role pretty seriously, I thought. Um, and so he was pointing out everything anybody could take exception to. And I went, that's okay. I like it. 
it's going to stay. It has to be there for me. So I made some changes, and I even, he always thinks I never change anything. So I kept track of what I had changed, and there were like 30 changes to the manuscript. Not big ones, but I did at probably leave some stuff out that he thought was unnecessary. But the thing about it is that when you take creative writing classes, they tell you you have to be, have a consistent point of view, right? The narrator has to be the same. And if it's, and it's one character, you follow one character and their experience and transformation, etc. But I like Victorian novels, and I particularly like um, Vanity Fair by Thackeray, which just breaks all the rules. You know, just it's chaotic. I love it, um, and and charming, in its way, and uh, and so every time somebody read it, who's a, an expert writer or teacher or student, uh, in the margin there would be lots of POV question mark, and I would go, yep, yep. We're going to take a little trip into somebody else's head and come back. You know, just like we did with Lollipop at the bank robbery. Like, oh, no, no, you can't do that. You can't go into her head. It's like, I think you can because it's important to me, and maybe this is something that I want people to get from this, is that we're all our own protagonists. We even have theme music in a way, sometimes in the back of our heads. Here she comes. All right. Um, but everybody else is in that, is doing that also. So we are each other's extras as well. We are background to other people's lives. And I just wanted to make the, the people alive for just that moment, you know? So, yes? Did you consider sending it to James Fry's agent as a personal tell-all? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I didn't. He got into so much trouble. Um, he originally wrote that as a novel. I'm told by somebody, I don't remember who, who knows a lot more than I do about it, that it was originally shopped as a novel and he couldn't sell it. And so then he went, okay, memoir, go for it. <laughs> no, nah, no, I'm not, like, I'm not like Tina in any way. Uh, she's a real different character. And I tend to do that because I don't want to be autobiographical and whiny. If I wrote about myself, I would be whiny. They weren't nice to me. <laughs> it was awful. So I tend to, let, you know, I'm much braver about other people's ordeals and trouble. Yes. You were talking about um, a new novel that you were working on. Mm -hmm. That one doesn't have a title yet, which is too bad, because then I could pre-sell it a little. Um, it's, it ended up being set in, in the like, late 1890s to <clears throat> early 1900s, which is, was not my intention originally. I never thought I'd like to write a historical novel. And it means I do have to do some research. Darn it. But uh, Google is great. Um, <laughs> And I had to go to Martinique. Oh dear, I have to go to Martinique to do some research. What a shame. Huh? It's a shame I'm a bad traveler. I did not get the most out of it, because I go, well, it's different. Um, so what did you ask me? Oh, the, uh, this novel, the new novel, is about 3 quarters of the way drafted. And I'm drafting pretty deeply this time. Uh, and it arose from a series of coincidences, which it always does. It's like there is a muse, right? When you need something, you find it, right? I needed something to make this serious. And I Googled, I, I thought whore's luck, there would be some kind of Swedish thing, or not Swedish, but I was thinking Cornish or Irish. Oh, the luck of the whore, you know? I don't know, I just had that in my head, right? And, and I thought, well, I don't know if that exists or not. So I Googled whore's luck. And the first link was the Swedish definition, the word. Ow. Thank you, I said. That's cool. And everything else was pornography. 
right? But I just needed the one. I did not shop around. I went, that's the one. That's the one. Um, so this one is about a woman who uh, is a painter. And so I really want to write about the painting life. Her life as an artist, which is fun to do because I am not an artist. And if you've seen me uh, draw a map of England, you know how, how flaky my uh, art skills are. Um, but it's fun to imagine what her painting would be, what it would mean, how it would feel like that. And, and I got her wedged into history pretty well. She, she participates in, in a sort of not quite Forrest Gumpy way, but um, she, things happen around her and to her that are bits of history. So I had to research that because I didn't, you know, but I also moved things around. You know, I, I put the park that I wanted in St. Louis. It wasn't actually there yet, but I put it in earlier, like a year or two. I mean, maybe somebody from St. Louis will be upset. I don't know. I've never been to St. Louis either. Yes? I lose momentum regularly. And uh, I think, uh, basically, that's what I do. I go, hmm, I kind of run through. It's kind of like daydreaming, fantasy kind of stuff. What would happen in show? And um, I, get, I don't get writer's block like people do. I have not so far. And I enjoy writing. It's not painful to me at all. It's fun. Even writing really gritty stuff is fun. Um, I just start writing. I go, OK, well, this is going to be crummy, but I can fix it later. I just need to get into the part I know I want to do. I want to get to that scene, so I have to somehow get her where the scene's going to happen. Right? Um, so yeah, that's what I do. But I have to say, the hard, it's not hard to start writing. It's really hard to stop writing. And if I walk away from writing, I can't write on the same day I teach. Because I'll come in, and it will be like, who are you people? What, what are we doing? What? You know, I just can't. And I may not even get there on time or at all, because, because I'm so disoriented from reality. I come back. So far, I've come back every time. But um, I need to write this summer, because my novel, to finish some more of your question, is three quarters done, drafted. And I know there are things I have to fix, because I made some stuff up. And then I did some research. Mm. And there's good stuff in the research that then is going to make that chapter more dramatic. But it's not there now. And it just means I have to redo the whole thing. You know, they can't just be sitting around going, hmm. Well, this is interesting when the volcano blows up. I mean, it has to be, it, they ha it did blow up. And so they have to be in that, reacting to that. So, yes? Did you do much, talking about the volcano, did you do much research on volcanoes? I mean, how they blow up and Well, just, there was just one volcano that I had to worry about. And that was in Martinique. Uh, Mount Pele in, in Martinique, which did blow up at the appropriate time. Who knew? You know? I mean, it just worked out that way. Um, I wanted her to go somewhere where she could have an affair at a very young age. What if, I thought at middle class St. Louis, it probably wouldn't happen. So uh, she goes to Martinique with her great aunt, and she has an affair. And when she goes back is when it blows up. She's in the, she's in the harbor. Of, of the of uh, Saint Pierre is the t it's a big city, and uh, thirty about thirty three thousand people dead in five minutes. It was a big deal. It was the biggest natural disaster of the twentieth century, like in nineteen o one. So we had all the rest of the century to have disasters in, and none of them was as big and bad as that one. Krakatoa was the previous century, so it was, it was out. So yeah, so I, I kind of perk up when there's volcanoes in movies. But um, I learned just enough 
Because I always have, a, I, so far, I always have a protagonist who doesn't know what's going on. This is very helpful to me as someone who usually doesn't quite know what's going on either because uh, then they can be confused, we can be confused together. So that I don't have to say, and then the internal temperature rose to a lot, <laughs> you know, and some rocks and stuff, and then the big cloud. So, and there were also exist um, survivors firsthand. And I read those with a great deal of interest. But I had to keep going, OK, but my person is in the harbor. She doesn't know all this stuff. There's no way she's ever going to know that that happened. I do. And they did. But I, have to, I had to really work on that, being sure that I wasn't saying, and meanwhile, there was this guy, and he was like a cobbler. And he, you know, it's like, no, 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 she doesn't know that. She wouldn't know that. She's in it. So yes. In a heartbeat. I would. I think it would be a great movie. Um, I would like, I, would I, keep, I know the name of Jodie Foster's agent, let me just say. So I could send a copy. I don't know. It's kind of like dropping them off a cliff, though. Here's a copy, gone, you know, and nothing ever happens. That's just how it is. But I might do that because I think it would be so fun would be so, so fun to see. And I think there are a lot of very cinematic uh, moments that would, just good scenes, good scenes. In my humble opinion, as if I had one, I think it would be a really good movie. So if any of you are secretly Hollywood talent scouts or uh, talk to me later, you know, or now, We'll just ditch the rest of these people and go make a deal. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you had a question? No? Yes? No. Sometimes a head scratch looks like a question. No? Yes. Oh, it's really, yeah. Talk to you, encourage you, Discourage you, if, if it's called for, yeah. It's, I think it's really important. Uh, I don't have as much of that as I would like, because I'm kind of tied down in some ways. Um, but uh, I go try to go to people's readings and try to go to different writerly things. It's really, it's hard to do for me. but. It's good, and I have a Nara guard, and I have my younger sister, who's a big fan, big fan. Um, and then I have my older sister, who's a painter, which is really useful to me with this new novel, because I'm just saying, oh, and then she made a painting, you know, like this. And I always run it past her and say, could she do that? Could she do that in the time? Could she do that with those materials? And, and so far, I, I, she thinks she could. So it's good to check, though, because you could have like, and then he did the Sistine Chapel. And for lunch, you know, it's like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I have to, I don't know how long it would take to do stuff. Uh, so that's helpful. And Christian is a good reader for me. Uh, I ignore a lot of what he says, but he's still a good reader for me. And. Uh, and he always says it's awesome, which is, you know, he says everything's awesome, but I ignore that. And I go, oh, I, my book is awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else has helped me. Well, the whole ad lumen, there's two or three or four people who read uh, ad lumen manuscripts for editing purpose for continuity, stuff like that, because it's real easy to lose that continuity. Um, I think it was John Hess in the first book who said, I'm sorry, he's five feet tall, she's five seven, he cannot nibble on the nape of her neck. <laughs> and it was like, huh, what? Even if she, you know. 
So things have to be changed. Just things like that which throw people off. You know, if you're reading a book and you hit something like that, you go, oh, I don't think so. This can't be real. So shoulder blade, shoulder blade. Anyway, yeah, so there are the, that group of people, uh, Karen Karate reads for, who else is it? And you and, and I don't remember, I should remember Tracy probably, Gordine. Uh, they, just, they just read it, and so that's fun. If you don't ask a question, I'm going to read you something. Okay, I got that one. So basically, Tina ends up in this little fishing resort with no money and no friends and nothing, nothing. So she works her way. She, and this is her first look at the river. This is after a very, 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 very hard day of work. And this is, I have to say, I don't like nature writing. I really don't. I think it's boring. I skip it when I'm reading something quite often, especially when it tells what the species of the, you know, when the burble berries bloom, or I don't know anything about it, you know? So, and again, my, neither does Tina, so that's good. Um, but this, so I tried really hard to remember what it was like to go camping as a kid, uh, against my will, but to go camping, so and to what it would be like for her who has been in the city all her life, in clubs, right, and, and various things like that. So I'll just end with this. Uh, she's, she's had this hard, hard day, okay. By 7.30 when the cafe closed and the cleanup was done, Tina was very tired and very tired of Bill he had grudgingly given her the keys to the red truck with the camper shell, but it was too light and too early for bed. So she followed Pete, another person there, down to the river and sat at a distance on a big dished out rock and watched him cast his line into the water again and again. There was a dreaminess to watching him, the arc of his body as he cast, extending into the curve of the line. She watched wordless, unmoving, her mind blank. Foster a cat. Foster um, sat at her feet and then rolled onto his back, gazing up at her, as fetching as a skinny black tomcat can reasonably be. She smiled at him and reached over to tickle his tummy. He pretended to gnaw on her knuckle, paddled her hand with his back paws, and then scampered away to hunt for bugs. This was the first time she had really looked at the river. Up to this point, she had only driven up and down it, looking for the campsite, raced over it in the dark, and then trudged over and over it blindly as she cleaned up her campsite and looked for a place to sleep. Now she faced it and was still. Her impression was of untidiness, tumbled rocks, jumbled leaves, uneven riverbanks, trampled mud, wads of root, messy bushes like a vacant lot, but no trash, no bed springs, no paper, no colored wrappers, so that everything she could see was shades of gray and brown and green, even the gleaming surface of the river. The tree trunks lolled instead of standing, but stretched up implacably. The wild grass showed uneven patches of dirt, not worn down by human feet. The rocks were strewn like accent pillows, without purpose or design. The tiny lavender flowers seemed random and senseless. Where corners of the world should be, the contours were rounded and softened and vulnerable looking. If she dared to wander into those darkening woods, her path would have to curve and loop and accommodate the shape of the ground and would never arrive at an intersection. Everything would be the same. Strange, then familiar, but still strange. Safely indifferent to her, but dangerously indifferent. The unnerving thoughts made her shiver. She breathed in the thin, wet air and the exhalation of pine trees, mud, and something else, something green or brown. She realized that the smell of plastic, exhaust, and people, 
their sweat, their worry, their passions, their effort was entirely missing. Instead, there was this something else, something she only vaguely remembered for her one time at Red Robin camp when, when she was small, a smell she could not name then or now. The air buzzed and clicked and throbbed, but quietly like traffic a long way away, like everything present was also distant, and the river managed to be both quiet and chuckling, peaceful and lively. She could hear her own breathing and the whir of Pete's fishing pole and the silence of Pete's line as he laid it gently in the water. The first big star appeared even though the light was still there, but starting to thin. It shone steadily in the sky between the tops of the trees that lined the river. And Tina remembered having seen it before, maybe even the same star, maybe another like it. The very tips of the trees fanned themselves in the little wind that blew up high that Tina couldn't feel at all, and the smaller trunks rocked slightly. If Tina had been less tired, she would have been bored. She tried to think, but she had no paper or pencil, and all she could think was that it was probably going to be all right one, day or one way or another. The cat was good, Pete was kind of a pest, and Bill was a hard boss to please, but really, she could work hard. She wasn't just saying that. And she watched the first big star and the stars that joined it rippling on the surface of the dark water and sighed. The first day was over. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. For sale at the bookstore, also on Amazon. And I'll be happy to sign anything that you want me to, except a blank check. Okay? So thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. <laughs>